from Microbe TV. This is Beyond the Noise, episode number 24, recorded on December 26, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. Hello, Paul. Happy holidays to you. You too. Today, well, this is a video version of Paul's column on Substack. It's called Beyond the Noise, Cutting to the Chase on Important Health Topics. And today, just published this morning, we're going to take a look at Paul's column, Labels Matter, Operation Warp Speed and Emergency Use Authorization. And you say in your column, uh, during the early stages of the COVID pandemic, both the CDC and the FDA use certain words or phrases that inadvertently frightened or confused the American public. So let's start with Operation Warp Speed. What exactly was that? Right. So this was a program under the Trump administration whereby they gave $11 billion and bet on six companies to win one race, <laughs> um, basically taking the risk out of it for pharmaceutical companies. And it made for a much, much quicker timeline because typically when a pharmaceutical company makes a medical product like this, a biological product, they go through a series of stages um, and they're done sequentially. They're not done pretty much all at the same time. And for example, you would wait to make sure that in a large trial, your vaccine in this case uh, worked and was safe before, say, committing to building a building and manufacturing millions of doses where this here, this was all sort of truncated. So it was it was a phenomenal program. Um, I think, frankly, uh, here was a virus that was first raised its head and entered the human population in late 2019. Um, as an animal to human spillover event, the virus was isolated and sequenced uh, by January of 2020. And 11 months later, you had a vaccine uh, using a novel technology, messenger RNA, with which we'd had no previous experience. Um, and the size of those two clinical trials of Pfizer, Moderna's mRNA trials were the size of any typical adult or pediatric vaccine trial. I think it honestly it was the most amazing scientific achievement in my lifetime. And I'm old enough to have... Uh, <laughs> lived during the polio vaccine era. So I think it was amazing. Yeah, I've, I think I've lived longer than you. And I thought it would take five years at the onset to have a vaccine. And we had it in a year. So the program was great. But what's the issue with the name? Well, so so the um, there was an FDA, a senior person at the FDA, who was a Star Trek fan. <laughs> and so he, he liked the name uh, Warp Speed, which at least if you're a Star Trek fan, you would realize means speed faster than the speed of light. And so he, he gave it that name. I, I, it was uncomfortable, I think, for some people to see this happen as quickly as it did, because it, you could understand it. Uh, people thought if it's being made this quickly, when typically a vaccine takes 10 years to make, 15 years to make, 20 years to make. I mean, I was fortunate enough to work on a rotavirus vaccine that took 26 years to make. How could you possibly make it this fast without truncating a critical stage in the process or worse, ignoring safety guidelines. So I think when people heard the term warp speed, if anything, that didn't allay those fears, sadly. So you could have argued, maybe we could have called it, you know, Operation Defeat COVID or End the Pandemic, something like that. Um, I, so this is really Operation Warp Speed too, when you think about it, because, and you know this better than me, the, the polio vaccine really was, was made much more quickly because of the the money that was put into it by the March of Dimes, which was a private philanthropic organization that basically paid these companies to make a vaccine while it was still being tested. So in, in, in a way, it was similar to that. And, and so it was a great program. But I think um, by naming what we named it, it didn't allay the fears that things weren't being done too quickly. Yeah, but that's, that's a sort of hindsight thing. Well, who knew that that was going to be an issue, right? Exactly. It's always easy in retrospect. I mean, I thought, we on Twitter have often discussed how it probably wasn't a great name, right? Because anytime you imply speed, people assume you're cutting corners. And hopefully um, next time <laughs> we will have learned from this and we won't do that, right? But who knows? Right. I think that the thing that really did worry people legitimately was that we were coming, it was an election year. 2020 was an election year. And here you had an election that was happening at the beginning of November. Well, in order to complete the, the safety protocols, which is to say to follow up 
two months after the last dose, in this case, the second dose, that took you into the beginning of September. So there was, I'm sorry, to the beginning of December. So that that um, would have been after the, the election. And, and uh, then President Trump wanted to uh, move this along. He wanted to have the vaccine before the election. And so he put a lot of pressure on the FDA commissioner, who at the time was Stephen Hahn, to do this now, to make sure we didn't have that two-month waiting period, but rather had a, a little less than a month waiting period. And Hahn, to his credit, stood up. He was brought into the into the Oval Office and in an invective-laden tirade was screamed at to get this done early, but he stood tall. And so we had that two-month safety uh, follow-up, which, which you had to have. So... It, it all did work very well, but I think you're right. I think the name um, implied speed, and speed always implies, you know, that corners could be cut. About the polio vaccine, well, it's true that the uh, the March of Dimes National Foundation, they really pushed Jonas Salk to do it very quickly. Uh, we'd been working on a polio vaccine since the virus was discovered in 1906, so I always like to say it took 50 years to get the science together, you know, understand how it's transmitted, understand their three serotypes and so forth. And then that made it ready for, for Jonas Salk to do that. And of course, uh, all of that science adds up and, and it was used for COVID vaccines as well. No, that's a really good point. And, and technically, mRNA vaccines weren't new. I mean, they, in the sense that they'd been worked on since 2005, initially in an attempt to make an HIV vaccine. So that's right. a good point. So the second word, set of words that you write about is emergency use authorization. Tell us what that is. So that's the term that's used instead of licensure because um, the, 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 the techniques or the style in which the FDA really supervised this program was, were different than would have been done for a typical vaccine made on, on a typical timeline. I mean, typically the way it works is that, you know, the companies um, finish their phase three trial and then uh, submit their biological license application to the FDA for approval, which takes about 10 months. And during that period of time, the FDA licenses three things. They license the product. They license in detail the process by which the product is made, whereby the company submit a series of protocols that are looked at very carefully by um, the FDA. And they also license the building. And that occurs following then that biological license application. That's not the way it happened here. The way it happened here was it was ongoing. I mean, the, the FDA was clearly supervising the protocols. The FDA was clearly supervising the building in which these, uh, these vaccines were made. So it was happening in real time rather than later. So really, it wasn't in the end any different. The final product, this product that was uh, authorized through emergency use authorization, was the exact same as the product that would have been licensed. But because the term was used, emergency use authorization, there were people like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. or uh, Ron Johnson, who was uh, a Republican uh, senator from Wisconsin. Wisconsin or Tucker Carlson, who said, I'm not getting that vaccine. I'm not getting this emergency vaccine. I'm going to wait until the vaccine is licensed. And a number of people picked that up. They chose to wait till the product was licensed, which was um, ridiculous in the sense that it was the exact same product. So all they were doing was leaving themselves at risk unnecessarily. Has this term been used before, Paul? I think it has um, in certain situations, but it was new to me. I mean, I'm, uh. I'm you know, a voting member on the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee. I hadn't heard that before. And, and I can tell you that when we had that December meeting, the first was on December 10th of 2020, we did bring that up because all of us noticed that this was really no different in terms of the way that it was being supervised. It was just being done more quickly. And so we worried about the word emergency and would prefer, prefer just to use the word authorization. I think it would have scared people a little less. Why couldn't but again, they? Why couldn't they have just licensed it immediately? We called it licensure. I think that's a, that's a very good question because certainly it was it, the rigor was still arguably the same. And certainly it would, would have also helped, I think, because, I mean, I was fortunate enough to be on this FDA's Vaccine Advisory Committee where I got to meet people like Marion Gruber or Phil Krause, you know, these sort of mm -hmm. longtime uh, senior members of the FDA who are, who are very rigorous and, and, and anybody who uh, spends any time dealing with people who work at the FDA are really uh, encouraged by how careful they are, how thorough they are. I, I do think they tend to be fairly quiet. I, it would have been, been nice if they got up in front of the media and said, look, this is what we're doing. This is how we're regulating this product to kind of reassure people, but uh, they, they didn't do that. Of course, again, in hindsight, 
it wasn't a great idea to call it an EUA. A lot of people didn't even understand it, as you said. Some people took advantage of it, but many, many Americans simply didn't understand what it meant. So I, I think, you know, the FDA has had long, many years of tradition and, and they do their work very well, but they have to be a little more flexible, I think. And uh, and this is a time when they should have been and just said, we're going to license it. But again, how would they know? It's hindsight, right? <laughs> right. I think in theory, their communications people could help them out with that. And I think they, I do think, I feel the way about the CDC as well. I think we really need to get out there and explain things in detail at, at, at like not at a, at a level, an eighth grade level, meaning newspaper level where, you know, people and trusted people will understand I mean, Some people won't understand, but, but, you know, do your best to try and explain it in detail. Trust the American public that they can understand the detail, including scientific details. Well, I, I do hope that these two kinds of issues, the <laughs> warp speed and the EUA, I hope in the next pandemic we don't use them. I hope the FDA and the CDC remember. You can find Paul Offit at Beyond the Noise. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent.